This week has seen the Ugandan government investigate supply of relief food in northeast Karamoja region by WFP after three fatalities and more than 150 people were taken ill. Plus, the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, along with other aid agencies, are in a race against time to save hundreds of thousands in Mozambique after Cyclone Idai ravaged through the capital. This is Africa Focus. Let's take a look at the stories in store. Mitigating sexual violence in the Horn of Africa, Somali security forces train participants on the vice. Protecting Ethiopia's heritage, residents of Lalibela worry that their churches could be destroyed by toppling screens meant to protect them. Glass art. We are in Kenya, where an artist is making art on glass. I'm Lenny Rashid, and our assigned language interpreter is Monica Mwangi. Before we get into the main stories, let's take a look at the news that made the headlines around the continent. Residents of Mozambique port city of Beira complained they had no food or clothing as they returned to try to rebuild their lives after Cyclone Idai hit millions across Africa. The cyclone hit Mozambique's coast on March 14th and moved inland throughout the weekend, leaving heavy rains in its wake. The official death count across the country stands at 84, but President Felipe Nyusi now estimates more than 1,000 people may have died there. United Nations officials said on Tuesday that the winds and floods that swept across southeastern Africa affected more than 2.6 million people and could rank as one of the worst weather-related disasters recorded in the southern hemisphere. Zimbabwean President Emerson Mnangagwa arrived in Mutare to visit areas affected by the cyclone that may have caused over a thousand deaths in Zimbabwe and Mozambique. Some of the most affected areas are not yet accessible, and high winds and dense clouds have hampered military rescue helicopter flights. The eastern district of Chimanimani was worst hit, with houses in most of the region's bridges washed away by flash floods. Soldiers on Sunday helped rescue the surviving nearly 200 pupils, teachers and staff who had been trapped at a school in Chimanimani. The majority of the missing are thought to be government workers whose housing complex was completely engulfed by raging waters. Their fate was unknown because the area was still unreachable. At least 10 migrants died when their boat sank off the Libyan coast near the western town of Sobrada on Tuesday, a Libyan security official said. About 18 others were rescued, said Ayman Dabashi, Sobrada security operations spokesman. Dabashi told Reuters that according to a survivor from Sudan, the boat was carrying about 27 illegal migrants who set off the western town of Zuara, but he added security forces are still finding out more people. The United Nations Migration Agency, IOM, said 15 survivors had been brought to a hospital, but he did not know how many people had been on board. Libya's western coast is a main departure point for migrants fleeing poverty and wars to reach Europe. Though numbers have dropped since Italy and the European Union stepped up efforts to support the Libyan Coast Guard. It was a special kind of season warm-up for the reigning cliff diving world champions Rihanna Ifland and Gary Hunt when they headed for a cliff dive and safari adventure in South Africa. The record-winning duo could choose from majestic cataract falls, circular basins flanked by red rocks, and what is said to be the greenest canyon on earth when they scouted the Drakensberg escarpment region of Western Mpumalanga, South Africa. It was the box lac potholes that attracted the cliff divers' attention, most during their quest for untouched takeoff spots a month prior to the first stop of the 2019 Red Bull Cliff Diving World Series. Before the seven-stop world tour kicks off the Philippines on April 13th, the sport's most decorated athletes sees the cliff diving safari to gain confidence for the acrobatic free falls from up to 27 meters at speeds in excess of 85 kilometers per hour. With less than a week before the presidential polls in Comoros, opposition candidate Mohamed Ali Soilihi says that it is time President Azali Asumani steps aside. Azali initially seized power in a coup against an acting head of state in 1999. He went on to win elections and remained in power until 2006. Azali was elected in 2016 and is tipped by observers to win the election. The first round is due to be held on March the 24th. 
President Asumani Azal, who was elected in 2006, has been predicted by observers to win the election, the first round of which is due to be held on 24th March. Thirteen candidates have already been cleared for the exercise, but Azali's main opponents have been barred. My candidature is about national peace and stability. I think Azali's policies risk an embargo on Moheli or a breakaway in Ajuan. The candidates have demanded a manual counting of votes at polling stations in the presence of candidates' representatives to ensure a credible and fair elections. Azali initially grabbed power in a coup against an acting head of state in 1999. He went on to win elections and remained in power until 2006. His critics maintains his behavior is authoritarian and accuse him of trying to hang on in power until 2029. We hear they're going to steal the elections, but we're not going to let it go. We'll go all the way. We'll go all the way. If Azali wins March's poll, he will be considered to be starting a first term under the law, which would allow him to seek a second term in 2024. 30 personnel from the Somali National Security Forces have successfully concluded a training of trainers course, which aims at mitigating conflict-related sexual violence in the Horn of Africa country. The four-day workshop, which attracted participants from security institutions and federal member states, drew participants from the National Intelligence Service Agency, the Somali National Army, the Somali Police Force, Ministries of Defense, Internal Security, Justice and Women, and human rights development. The four-day workshop was organized by the African Union Mission in Somalia. Focus on the training was the protection of women and children during conflict. We have trained them in various methodologies, the styles, the strategies they have to adapt to be able to impact, to be able to make sure that the communities are free of crime, to make sure that our women and girls are well protected in our society. The purpose for this is for them to be able to exercise the skills that we would have transferred in the past four days they have been here with us to train others in the sectors where they are coming from. AMISOM, in collaboration with the British Embassy in Somalia, with facilitation from the Federal Ministry of Defense and the Office of the President, Ambassador Francisco Madeira, the Special Representative of the Chairperson of the African Union Commission, SRCC for Somalia, say the trainees will in turn impart knowledge acquired to their colleagues in a bid to promote compliance to international humanitarian law and international rights law. Equally critical is the need to train Somali security forces on how to support survivors of sexual violence in a manner that does not further harm, but ensure that the service they need are met and that the perpetrators of the crime are brought to justice. This is the fifth training to be conducted for the Somali National Security Forces on the prevention and response to conflict-related sexual violence. Similar training has been held in Jubaland, Hirshabil, Galmuduk and Southwest States. Ambassador Madeira notes with concern that sexual violence remains a key protection issue for women and girls in Somalia. He says conflict, insecurity, weak legislation in law enforcement, gender inequality and displacement are major contributing factors to the vice. A child born of rape who is excluded from their village and excluded from their community may, one, may well one day end up being recruited by al-Shabaab. So if we want the Somali security forces to be as I think they should be, the, pr the pride of this country, we have to ensure that they put the protection of civilians and the protection of, of the weak at the heart of what they do. Adebayo Karim, Amisom's Head of Protection, Human Rights and Gender Unit, underscores the importance of the training during the transitioning of national security responsibilities from Amisom to the Somali Security Forces. He recognizes that such capacity building initiatives will build a pool of Somali experts who can provide training to their counterparts in specified areas. We want you to take the lead in this training exercise, not only in Mogadishu, not only in the 
uh, Bernadil region, but in the southwest, in the uh, Juba land, in uh, Hishabili, <coughs> in Galmudu. Present at the workshop was Lieutenant Colonel Andy Doney, the commander of the UK Somali National Army Support Team, UKSST, who revealed that the United Kingdom will provide training to SNA soldiers from the Southwest States 6th Division. Residents of the Ethiopian town of Lalibela worry that the massive tarpaulin screens erected to protect ancient churches could collapse and destroy the historic churches located in the ancient town. Designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1978, the Lalibela churches are the unique as they are carved from rock and sit below ground level, surrounded by deep dry moats with only their roofs visible. Priest Mekorin Fatne stood among his Ethiopian Orthodox faithful, looking upon a 9th century old church they feared could be wrecked at any minute. Over the church loomed a massive tarpaulin screen supported by a lattice of metal, one of four shelters erected to protect the northern Ethiopian town of Lalibela's historic churches, but which residents worry, despite experts' assurances, could destroy them. <laughs> Take a look at this huge metal panel. Underneath there is a church. What you see on the top of the roof is also heavy metal. Our worry is if this shelter collapses, it will destroy the church. Designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1978, the Lalibela churches are unique. They are carved from rock and sit below ground level, surrounded by deep dry moats with only their roofs visible. Preservationists say the shelters erected in 2008 to keep off rains of the churches pose no threat, but the structures have nonetheless become a symbol of the neglect of Libella residents say they and the complex endure. Located 680 kilometers north of Addis Ababa, Lalibela is a popular destination for foreign tourists and followers of the Ethiopian Orthodox faith, the country's largest religion. Priests and worshippers at the complex complain the shelter's heavy support pillars have damaged the underground Trinity Chapel, its roof cracking under the weight of the support pylon. We consider it as our second Jerusalem. The fact that all the 11 churches are carved out of one rock is a miracle to us. Every time I come here, I feel completely different. The chapel is not open to the public. Locals also worry about the soundness of the shelters, which came with a 10-year guarantee. Uh, the wind pressure has increased by 50% currently from the time the shelter was built, according to professional studies. If it increases more than this and shakes the shelter, there is a big possibility that it will fall on the treasure and could demolish it. Last year, Lalibela residents spotting shirts reading Save Lalibela stage a protest over the church's condition, according to Negash. Ethiopia's Prime Minister Haile Said Abi and France President Macron, who has been in the country, signed an agreement for the temporary shelter's maintenance and the hiring of scientists to look into permanently restoring damaged churches. This could pave the way for the shelter's replacement with the later structures, possibly ones that can open and close depending on the weather, while repairs are done. Coming up after the break, a painting soul hogs the limelight at a South African farm. We're taking a short break now. Don't go away. Keep it switched. Welcome back. In case you just joined us, you're watching Africa Focus on Switch TV and you can also catch this program on DSTV channel 268. Our sign language interpreter is Monica Mwangi. In the Akan culture, the communes are not only consulted for their knowledge of medicinal plants, but also for their power to ward off evil and predict the future. The culture is practiced by some 25 million people, mainly in eastern Ivory Coast and in Ghana's Ashanti Kingdom, once feared and admired for their knowledge and their role as links to spirits and ancestors. The communes are now seeing their practice being threatened by modern society as Christianity which is taking their followers away from them. A dozen women, their bodies coated with clay, sway to beating drums as if in a trance, ankle bells jingling as they stamp their feet in the eastern Ivorian town of Anyan Sui. 
they are training to become certified comians or priestesses stepped in traditional lore, the properties of medicinal plants, and the techniques of conflict resolution. They are credited with the power to cast spells and predict the future at a time when the Komians fear for their own future as modern society increasingly leaves tradition behind. I don't see anything special about saying that it gives me the same feeling to continue what I'm doing. Because they always say, we will help you, we will help you. Since 1992 until today, no one has come to my aid. That's why I currently want to stop because sometimes I receive more than 22 students. They are my responsibility. The women belong to the 25 million strong Akan ethnic group, predominant in eastern Ivory Coast and across the border in Ghana in the bosom of the traditional Ashanti kingdom. No local king or tribal chief can be enthroned without the intervention of these priestesses whose school set up in 1992 gained national recognition in 2014. Even so, the school is slowly deteriorating, its ochre walls have not been painted for years, and most of its buildings are in disrepair. The course lasts at least three years, with around 20 graduates each year. They can then take official positions in their local villages or set up private practices. The school, bordered on one side by a teak plantation, features a large central courtyard with a giant mango tree, the meadow, surrounded by houses. People come to the school seeking cures or treatment from the communes for conditions such as cancers, infertility, epilepsy and mental illness. Others come for counseling over personal problems. Donc, effectivement. Indeed, if we are not careful, this, this part of our society, this culture of our society is in danger of disappearing. Criticism of communes, notably from evangelical churches, is becoming insensitive and acabic in the town of Amalikia, between the big city of Abenguru and Anyonsu. Around 20 priestesses are sounding the alarm, saying they lost a great defender in the person of Jean Marie Adifia, who died in 1999. The author, who was awarded France Grand Prix in 1981, advocated the modernization of African religions. He coined the word Bosonism to capture the religion pervaded by communes. Boson, meaning the spirits believed to inhabit rivers, mountains, and forests, as well as figurians. Nowadays, spirits continue to be incarnated in young children. If you refuse to submit to it, they drive you crazy. If you obey them, you heal. The commands cannot disappear. Nevertheless, the communes are looking for benefactor to save the school or even allow it to expand to other regions. In the meantime, Pascal Abinan has promised to place the school on the tourist map as means of promotion and fundraising. Glass art was invented by the ancient Phoenicians and brought to the fore by the Romans as they conquered one territory after another. The art is not that common on the African continent. However, for one Tony Mugo, glass art is not just a means of earning a living, but a way of expressing himself. Let's take a look. In 1991, after completing high school, Tony Mugo started painting on canvas. Later though, he would move to glass art. Employed in various glass companies in Kenya, he sharpened his glass engraving skills. In 1998, he ventured into self-employment when he established his own enterprise at the current village after training on art of stained glass in Germany. Tony believes that glass art is quite fascinating. So glass offers a lot of possibilities. Um, uh, colors come out vividly in glass. And uh, it's... I enjoy working with it because I use it for architectural spaces. So you want to block a view, you want to enjoy the light. So glass brings this out very, very well. At times, he also uses pieces of tiles when clients request. A church has already made such an order and his employees are already working on it. Churches and temples are among his biggest clients. Stained glass can be something you can hang also on a wall. That's something I'd like to get into or in a contemporary show as a gallery piece you know so that's the direction. Producing this kind of art can be hugely expensive since he has to import some of the ingredients however he says there can be a cheaper way out 
the 47-year-old father of one is already mentoring youths to make art cheaper art. There's a way you can look around and see what you can use yeah, that is considered as waste glass here. Yeah. And you can make nice art. I have, we've done projects with students from Kenyatta University and the idea is to reuse uh, broken pieces of glass, discarded bottles and make nice art out of it. With many youths still unemployed around the country, Tony says it's possible to turn their lives around. Well, I think you have to have passion, yeah. That's, that's one of the important ingredients to do anything. You have to love what you do. If you don't love it, then don't touch it. Even though success might take long to achieve, he advises that it comes with sheer hard work and determination. Pig Castle, yes, you heard right, Pig Castle, a rescued pig in South Africa, has become an art sensation. The soul was rescued from an abattoir as a piglet and brought to an animal sanctuary in Franschhoek, in South Africa's Western Cape region in 2016, where her new owner noticed her love of color and paint brushes. Her pieces are fetching thousands of dollars in various art galleries and Picasso's work has been displayed around the world and recently on Swiss watchmaker Swatch. Brandishing a paintbrush in his snout, Picasso enthusiastically tosses her head to create bright bold strokes across a canvas propped up in her sty. The soul was rescued from an abattoir as a piglet and brought to an animal sanctuary in Franschhoek in South Africa's Western Cape region in 2016, where her new owner noticed her love of color and paint brushes. Well, pigs are very smart, uh, smart animals. And so when I brought Picasso here to the barn, I said, how do I keep it entertained? And so we threw in some soccer balls, rugby balls, um, and of course there were some paint brushes um, lying around because the barn was, was newly built. And it was interesting, she basically ate or destroyed everything except these paint brushes. And I thought, gosh, maybe there's something in there because it was really strange that she loved them so much. And um, it just took a bit of positive reinforcement. And to be honest, it wasn't long before she was picking them up, going towards the canvas and creating these amazing masterpieces that are now sold all over the world. Except for the occasional burst of creativity, Picasso spends most of our days eating, strolling and sleeping. South African marketing consultant Sibu Mabena says the deal was a branding coup. The fact that an animal that we see as a means to an end, um, a pig, bacon, sausages, all of that, has now become this phenomenon in a whole different space is really cool because that means that there is an appetite for that kind of thing. There is an, there's a desire to see different things um, and people are taking an interest in all of this so it's working. I mean if an international watch brand like Swatch can align themselves to something as different as this it means they're also looking for something innovative, something different to what they've, they've been doing or what they've been seeing. So it works. The pig has earned the right to rest. Her paintings can sell for almost 4,000 US dollars, with the proceeds going to animal welfare. She has even had one of her artworks turned into a watch face for Swiss watchmaker Swatch. Swatch announced a collaboration with the pig last month. The limited edition Flying Pig by Miss Picasso features green, blue, and pink brush strokes and sells for 120 US dollars. Swatch executives say it's the best-selling item in their artist's range. Picasso is definitely an abstract expressionist. You can't exactly define what she's painting, but I can tell you that her style slightly changes depending on her mood, like any great artist. Um, sometimes I'll look at her artworks and I'll see something that, as a human, I can see, like a dolphin shape or, or there'll be a facial feature which makes it that much more interesting. But ultimately, it's definitely abstractive artworks and... Every time she paints a picture, she always finishes it by dipping her nose um, into beetroot ink and she takes it towards the canvas and that makes it an authentic, original Picasso. Picasso's art was taken on tour last year in the Oink exhibition. Her pieces were shown in South Africa, the UK, France, Germany and the Netherlands. 
wonders we'll never cease. On Africa Focus, we love hearing from you. So make sure you get interactive with us on our various social media pages. Remember, you can view this program along with our wide array of other programs on DSTV channel 268. On behalf of the entire team here on Africa Focus, thank you for keeping us company on this exciting journey around the African continent. Enjoy the rest of your viewing.